Hey guys, Matt here today, getting back into Hebrews, and today we're going to start Hebrews 12. Uh, we finished Hebrews 11, and we, we kind of did a, a um, macro look at it. We didn't we didn't do a detailed study of each character, uh, because I've already did that in, in previous videos. But we see that, that Hebrews 12, as we get into this, starts with a therefore, clearly tying it into the last chapter. In fact... The book of Hebrews is the great therefore book, right? It's it's always a, seems to be a therefore or a since or a for. It's always connected to the previous passages and, 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 and paragraphs. And what the author here says is, therefore, therefore, in light of all of these faithful brothers and sisters, in light of the fact that they were strangers and aliens, they didn't consider this world their home. In fact, they considered the reproach for Christ greater than gold and, and, and rewards and treasures that are found in this world. In fact, this world wasn't even worthy of them. Isn't that something? In light of all of that, the author says, here he's going to hit him a little hard, he says, in light of that, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance. There's that word endurance again. He used that at the end of chapter 10. Let us run with endurance. The race that is set before us looking to Jesus. Ah, Remember that? Consider Jesus. Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, yes, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Amen. Wow. So here the author, in the context, what's the context of, of Hebrews? It's kind of like a big rebuke. It's dealing with the subject of unbelief. The thief of unbelief. All sin stems from unbelief. Unbelief is the root. The specific sin is the fruit. We'll talk about that more when we get into chapter 13, because in chapter 13, he names a couple of them. Thus, uh, until now, he's been just kind of dealing with the, the root of unbelief. That's that's the big deal. Think of it this way. Uh, all, all sin comes from unbelief. Think of some sins. Pick some sins in your life or in others' lives. Oh, whatever they are. Uh, worry, stress, anger, drugs, alcohol, sex, uh, money worship, blah, blah, blah. They all come from unbelief. Worry. Well, I don't believe God really will keep me and, 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 and provide for me. Even though in chapter 13, the next chapter, he says, Keep your life free from the love of money, for he has, he has said he will never leave you or forsake you. So it's really worrying and stress and, and anxiety. That's really all that is is unbelief, right? Take sexual sin. We see that over and over. God warns us about sexual sin. You, you've heard me quote the verses, 1 Corinthians 6, 9, 1 Thessalonians 4, 3, Ephesians 5, 3, Colossians 3, 5. They're all, all dealing with this. And in, and in, in uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, 3, it says, keep your life free uh, from, from sexual sin. I'm paraphrasing. For God this is the will of God that you abstain from sexual immorality. That's what it says. For God is an avenger of these things. So when people give in to those kinds of sexual sins, what they're saying is, oh, I don't really believe God's enough to satisfy me, or I don't believe God's really an avenger. But what you can clearly see is it all comes from unbelief. So the author is dealing with the Hebrews' unbelief because they're flirting with unbelief by going back under the law. Yeah, you've, you, you've met Jesus, but you still got to sacrifice animals. you still got to keep this day holy, and you can't eat this, and you must eat that. All these things. Well, that's sin. That's unbelief. That really is unbelief. And so what he says is, let us lay aside every weight and sin. Now, he's going to start naming the sin. So again, unbelief is the root. Sin is the fruit. At the antithesis of that, belief is the root. And what's the fruit of belief? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, Galatians 5.22. Praise, praising God, Hebrews 13.15, we'll get into that. Sharing the gospel, Matthew 28. 
right? That all comes from faith, from belief. That's the, that's the fruit. Faith is the root. All those things are the fruit. Unbelief is the root. Sin, specific sin, we could say, is the fruit. So the author is saying, guys, lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance. This is where, again, it sounds very Pauline-like, right? He brings up athletics, a race. He brought up endurance in chapter 10 at the end, right? You, need of, you have need of endurance. Why do they have need of endurance? Before we look at this race analogy. How, let, let's look at this. How do you know if you're running the race with God with endurance? Well, we know this if when we get trials and tribulations, we have joy. In chapter 10, the author says you used to have joy when you received these trials and tribulations. Your houses was, were being plundered and all of your possessions were being taken, but you had joy. Ah, but now you need endurance because you're not having that joy anymore. You're taking your eyes off Christ. You're focusing on the world. Although, like the, the faithful in chapter 11, you're supposed to be a stranger, right? And an alien. You're not supposed to consider this world your home. When we start giving in to unbelief, we start growing roots into this world, and that's what they were doing. So the author says, guys, you need endurance. And again, we're, we're going to repeat ourselves here, but how do you get endurance? Does a runner get endurance by reading a book about endurance or reading a book about running? Can a marathoner sit on the couch and read a bunch of books about marathons and running and be a great marathon? No. How does he do it? By trials, by tribulation, by work, by sweat. That's why we, we looked at this. That's why God allows trials and tribulations to grow our faith. We saw that in Romans 5, 3 through 5. Paul says, I rejoice in my tribulation because tribulation leads to endurance. Ah, and endurance to character. Yeah, and character to hope. And hope doesn't disappoint because our hope is in Christ. The joyful expectation of Jesus Christ coming back. These things are a reality to us. So the author is trying to get to these guys. He's, he's beating them over the head here. Guys, you need to focus on all these people before us. And you need to lay down your weights and sins. Because you're in a race. You need endurance. Suffering's good. It teaches you endurance. Okay, well, we know that if we're going to run a race, we can't have sin tangling our ankles, right? You can't run with weights around your, your ankles. We get that, I think, in, in terms of sin. I think sometimes we, we like to put lipstick on our sin. We all have done it at one time or another and not deal with the reality that sin is really wicked because it, it, at its core it's unbelief. But the author says something even more trying to us, even more uh, convicting to us and to the Hebrews. He says, lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely. Every time I read this, it seems like God kind of brings things to my mind that might be weights in my life. What is a weight in our life? I mean, we, we know what sin is. Usually it's, it's pretty, pretty evident, but sometimes we can have these gray areas where we might try to hold on to something which might not necessarily be sin, ah, but it's not helping our race, right? It could be something you're drinking, something you're eating, something you're thinking, something you're looking at. It could be a, a relationship you're in, someone you're friends with, right? It could be uh, not getting into the Word enough. You're, it could be watching too much TV. It could be what you're watching. All of these things, you know, some of them might not specifically be sin, per se, ah, but they're weights. In fact, we might even say when these weights grow up, they turn into sin, perhaps. So the author is trying to get these guys' attention. He's saying, we've got to run with endurance. How do we do it? Well, how about we look to Jesus, <laughs> right? How about we look to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, he found us. He pulled us in. No one comes to the Son unless the Father draw him in. And the Holy Spirit convicts him of sin, righteousness, and judgment. And then Jesus gives us that gift of faith. And he saves us. That's how salvation is. He's the founder of our faith. Ah, but he's so much more. He's the perfecter. How does he perfect our faith? By teaching us endurance. 
by trials and tribulations. See, he wants us to be like these people in Hebrews 11, and ultimately, he wants us to be like him. We're, we're to be conformed in the image of the Son. Romans 8, 29, right? Im be ye therefore imitators of God, Ephesians 5, 1. That's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to imitate these guys in Hebrews 11, and we're also supposed to imitate Jesus Christ. What did Jesus Christ do? Well, we know, but let's, let's refresh our memory. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. What did all of the faithful in Hebrews 11 have in common with, with Jesus? Neither of them considered this earth their home. They were just passing through. And they were treated poorly. Ah, but... That was, that was what was supposed to happen because they had a message. Jesus had a message that Satan and the world didn't want to hear. He still doesn't. You go tell the gospel to somebody and, and watch the anger and the venom come out of them. That's what happened in Jesus' day. That's what was happening in Hebrews 11 and all these faithful. It still happens today. But we're supposed to consider him because he had joy. He had joy. What's the sign that you're handling endurance well, or st struggling or tribulation well? Like Christ, you have joy. Paul said that of the Thessalonians in 1 Thessalonians. They had joy in tribulation. That's why Paul always talks about that, like in Romans 5. Joy in tribulation, right? Colossians 1.27. Consider he carried on the sufferings of Christ. I mean, it's a joy to do that. And Jesus did that. He was the founder and perfecter of our faith, and he had the joy in him, the joy that was set before him. So therefore, he endured the cross. He went through it all because he wasn't focused on the cross. He was focused on seated, being seated at the right hand of the Father in heaven for the joy that was set before him. He was focusing on eternity. He was focusing on going back home and paying this price so there could be fellowship with us and God. Jesus, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. When we think of Jesus going on the cross, and we think of the Garden of Gethsemane and him sweating the blood, it wasn't for the, the, uh, the physical torture, I don't believe, that was the most stressful for Jesus. After all, crucifixion was common. Now, I don't mean this to be blasphemous or to discount what Jesus Christ did in the physical, but the real, the real price Jesus paid was knowing that for three hours, as he was on that cross, enduring wave after wave after wave of your sin and my sin, he felt separation from the Father. He felt this thing called sin, which he never felt before, and he felt shame. People were treating him like a common criminal, spitting on him, laughing at him. That's where the price was paid on that cross. But Jesus didn't focus on that. He focused on the joy set before him. So what's the author, what's the author trying to do here? He's saying, guys, don't focus on the world. Lay down those sins. Lay down those weights that are holding you back. Okay, maybe it's not sin. Is it helping you run your race? Is it driving you closer to Christ? Is it making you a better witness for Jesus Christ? Then lay it down. Right? That's what he's trying to get across here. Therefore, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, and since we have such a great Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, let us lay aside every weight and sin which entangles us and move on, just like Jesus did. Just like the, the faithful in Hebrews 11 did. So as we leave this little section here and move on to the next part of Hebrews 12, just focus on what in our lives we need to lay down. Because there's always something. If it isn't a physical object or a habit or, or, or something like that, it could be pride. It could be spiritual pride. We all have things that we need to lay down. Let's lay them down today and move on. Peace.